Harry going to Hogsmeade is going to put him in danger. So this scene, Harry is relatively safe, as safe as Harry can be with Voldemort on the loose. And it just moves him slightly closer to danger because it's opening the door to Hogsmeade. Okay. And I love that you're going here because this is like literally what I was talking with a client the other day. And that idea when the character doesn't know the main thread, how do you get the main thread in there? Well, that's why it's so important that the author knows. Right. Because then the author has opportunities to throw red herrings, to throw false breadcrumbs at them and turn them this way and that way, which creates setups for plot twists. Welcome to the Fiction Writing Made Easy podcast. My name is Savannah Gilbo, and I'm here to help you write a story that works. I want to prove to you that writing a novel doesn't have to be overwhelming. So each week, I'll bring you a brand new episode with simple, actionable, and step-by-step -step strategies that you can implement in your writing right away. So whether you're brand new to writing or more of a seasoned author looking to improve your craft, this podcast is for you. So pick up a pen and let's get started. In today's episode, we're diving deep into the first chapter of Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban. And once again, I'm joined by a very special guest, Abigail Perry, who is also a developmental editor, and she hosts an amazing podcast called Lit Match, where she helps writers find the best literary agent for their writing and publishing careers. I will link to her podcast in the show notes, as well as where you can find Abigail around the internet. Now, as you can probably imagine, I'm super excited to share this episode with you today because I'm a huge Harry Potter nerd. That's no secret. You know this by now, right? So I love Harry Potter, but I also think this is another great example of an opening chapter. And now we're in the third book in this series. So it's really fun to see how Rowling develops not only as an author, but how she develops the opening chapters from book to book. So in this episode, we're going to look at the first chapter of Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban, and we're going to analyze it both on the macro level and the micro level. So basically, why does the chapter work? And then how does the scene or the scenes within that chapter work? So that's a very quick overview of what we're going to dig into today. You're going to hear more explanation for everything once we get into the episode. So with that being said, let's go ahead and dive right into the conversation. And I've actually never looked at this one from an analytical standpoint yet, other than in our own private discussions for random scenes. So this will be a fun one to dissect together. And we'll give a little shout out to Renee, Renee Decker, who is writing the masterwork for Prisoner of Azkaban. And yeah, like Abigail said, we have not spent as much time with this one as we have Sorcerer's Stone or Chamber of Secrets. So I'm actually kind of excited to look at something a little more fresh. Before we get into it, we'd like to do a summary of the first chapter of Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban. So Savannah has written a great summary for us, and I'm going to let her take it away. Yeah, here we go. So in this scene slash chapter, it's after midnight and Harry is working on his history of magic essay in the dark under the covers of his bed. The Dursleys are mad at him right now because Ron Weasley called him on the telephone and basically yelled at Vernon through the phone since Ron does not know how to use a telephone. And because of that, Harry thinks this must be why Hermione hasn't been in touch either. So he's had no word from his wizarding friends for five weeks. That being said, there are a few improvements over Harry's last summer in Chamber of Secrets. So number one, he's allowed to let Hedwig fly around. And number two, he got birthday presents. So if you'll remember in Chamber of Secrets, he had the worst birthday. And so three owls deliver gifts from Harry's friends. Ron sent him a newspaper clipping from the Daily Prophet that talks about the Weasley's trip to Egypt and a pocket sneakoscope that can detect dark magic. Hermione sent him a broom cleaning kit and Hagrid sent him a book about monsters. He also got his Hogwarts letter that includes a permission slip for trips to Hogsmeade on certain weekends if they can get a parent or guardian's signature. Great. It's really interesting, this first chapter, because a lot happens in it, but not a lot of loud things happen in it. In the other first chapter episodes, what we have done first is we look at the big picture. We use seven key questions to analyze first chapters to make sure that you're doing the things you need to do to hook readers that we look at. So seven key questions that are taken from Paula Minet's great book, The Writer's Guide to Beginnings. And then, of course, we will move into the scene level, the structural level of how the scene works, which we use the Story Grid's Five Commandments to do that. If you've been listening to these first chapter episodes, you probably already know a lot of what these are. And just if you are coming in new, that's totally okay. We're going to walk you through it and we'll explain everything as we go. Okay. 
And let's move into the big picture first. So we like to look at the big picture first because that helps us get a grand idea of what this story is and expectations of what we should be looking at as we move into the story. There are seven questions. They focus on genre, plot, point of view, character, setting, core motion, and stakes. And the first of those really focuses on genre. So the question is, what kind of story is it? What Savannah and I like to look at is we see a difference between a content genre and a commercial genre. So content genre being what is really the makeup of the story, the target readers who would be going with it versus the commercial genre, is it middle grade fantasy? So Savannah, what do you think? What genre, what content genre we'll say? Right, so I think we're still in action territory. The first two books we've said were action and previous to jumping on this call, we were talking about how this story actually has a little bit of thriller elements and maybe even crime. We know there's a lot of crime subplots in the Harry Potter books, but the one main thing about thrillers that I see here is that there's the potential of a fate worse than death. And so in this book, we have the Dementors who can basically suck your soul out, right? So you could argue that is a fate worse than death for sure. There is a question, are we in thriller territory? But Abigail and I have kind of landed on, we're probably still in action. Mm -hmm. And I love that you're pulling out this idea though, that we do need to kind of look at some very loud subplot elements, I think that come into this and really raise the stakes, the life's and death stakes for the action story. Now, what's the difference? I think we should just go into that a bit more, Savannah. The fate worse than death. What is that extra factor that determines yeah. fate worse than death? And how could we be thinking about how the story starts and then how the story ends and why we would lean more towards action versus thriller? Yeah, that's a good question. And fate worse than death. I always think about The Walking Dead, how you could turn into a zombie. Like to me, that is a fate worse than death because you are forever walking around the planet trying to feed on humans, right? You don't get that soul piece. So in same with Harry Potter, like we said, the Dementors will suck out your soul. Mm -hmm. so, to me, that's a fate worse than death. Differences between action and thriller. Do you have any off the top of your head? I'm just going to well, think about it. It's interesting then to think about the climax of Prisoner of Azkaban and why this story in the series is extremely different than the others in the series, because I believe this is the only climax that has no Voldemort. So it's mm -hmm. one of those things where we actually are facing the Dementors and right. the person most at stake is actually serious. So sorry, spoilers. <laughs> if you haven't read this, you read it. Turn back now. Serious is the one that the Dementors are seeking. But the other, the why the Dementors really become extremely dangerous is because they start to disobey. Like they start to kind of start overstepping boundaries. And that's why Dumbledore is furious that they're even on campus. And when there's the hundred Dementors versus Harry, they're going after Harry too. So I think it's kind of dangling in the air. Would they suck out Harry's soul or not? They've been instructed to suck out Sirius's soul. It's interesting because who you think is the villain actually becomes the main victim. Yeah. And I think that that's a really interesting plot twist. Remembering that in an action story, you have a really important convention in action is that you have the hero villain victim triangle, that dynamic that's essential to the core story of an action story. And then do you remember, Savannah, is that in Thriller as well? Do you need a hero victim villain? Yeah, there's because there's a crime usually that kicks off the story with a villain. The one other difference I see, too, is that in an action story, there's usually an element of sacrifice. And I don't mm -hmm. think that has to be present in a thriller. Like we can be brave and we can stand up to bad guys, but it doesn't always have to come with that element of sacrifice. And that's a really good point. And then we always just want to say what's the secondary genre as well, because we are paying attention to the internal arc, the character arc for Harry Potter stories. The action story is interesting but you only really care about if Harry dies or lives if you like Harry. So it's thinking along the lines of, in addition to what's going on with the action stakes, the life and death stakes and in, in the story that's going to be revolved around that with the big picture, how can we also be looking at what his internal arc is, his character arc, and how is that going to be continually complicated and intensified as the story yeah. goes on? What do you so think, I think his internal arc is in the beginning? Well, I think we're still probably in worldview territory. And I think if I'm remembering, I'm going to pull from Renee's expertise here because she's the one that did a deep dive in this. I believe there was something in her analysis about learning how to trust his own resources, his own instincts, his own voice, mm -hmm. and not 100% relying on the adults because yes. kind of like look where that has got him in these last two books. So, you know, that's tested in a lot of ways. It's tested through the relationship with Sirius. First of all, thinking he's a bad guy, 
learning that he's actually not a bad guy mm-hmm. and things like that. So do you think that, that okay. is introduced at all in this first chapter? Or do you think that comes in in the later chapter? Well, I think we can say it kind of is because he has to get permission for this, for the Hogsmeade trip, right? Mm -hmm. So in a way, it's kind of like he's reliant on the Dursleys to allow him to go. He's reliant on McGonagall to allow him to go. So yeah, I think it's like a little flavor, but it's not quite all the way there. What do you think? No, I think that's great. I love that you said it's a little flavor because I think that's often what we've seen in books one, two, three. That's really what it's doing with the action story too. It's not throwing this giant threat at you right away. It's going to have a slow burn for until eventually, like usually around a midpoint moment, it becomes a really big action story. Right. But in these earlier chapters, there's more of this subtle, we're going to hint at things. We're going to make them really interesting because we care about the characters, but it's not going to be as loud until really we get to Hogwarts. Yeah. And it's definitely not something you pick up on when you read it the first time. So it's really interesting. And we can go into question two now, which is about the plot. Mm -hmm. So what is this story really about if it's an action story? Yeah, it's about life or death, right? It's the idea. (laughs) Is Harry going to survive or not? So in any action story, that's kind of the reigning question. It's about survival. We've talked about this before, but I like to look at three whiff of death stakes that comes from James Scott Bell and basically talks about physical death, professional death and psychological death. I've found usually it's a masterwork type of story. There's a combination of the three, but there's always one that takes precedence. So and then if it's an action story, that will be physical death. And you'll notice in all of the core scenes, life is on the line. Okay. Right. Then I also, you know, just for fun, like to throw it out there, I look at usually the internal stories. So if it be worldview, those would be psychological stakes, right? So the idea of if it's something like this, probably what Savannah just said, if it's about relying on adults, Will Harry learn to be able to stand on his own or will he always need the help of an adult? Something like that. And kind of see how his life starts to depend on that internal arc. Then I usually throw out just for fun, like a subplot question. That's what I would kind of look at for that idea. And this is interesting because like you just said, it reminded me of his age. So he's 13 in this book. He turns 13 in this chapter. And that's kind of like eighth grade going off to high school age. So it's kind of where we do take that step away from being super reliant on our parents. Mm-hmm. And we, tr- we want a little more independence. So that's interesting to think about. The other thing I would say about plot is like, this is going to be a story about Harry and Sirius Black and the truth about who they are and who- what their relationship is like. Yes. Sirius Black is not mentioned in this chapter, but he is mentioned in chapter two mm-hmm. via a news report. And Vernon gets all upset about the details of the news report. But we do see scabbers in this chapter Mm -hmm. via the article that Ron sends him. And we do introduce the Hogsmeade visits, which are where a lot of these important plot moments take place. The other thing to kind of note about genre and plot is that Rowling does recap Harry's history with Voldemort. We're not in the dark about what the story is going to be about plot wise or genre wise. It's all here, even though, like Abigail said, it's a little bit more quiet. We're in his bedroom after midnight. Nothing exciting is happening. And again, I think why you can get away with that in a first chapter for this book is because it's part of a mega hit series. Right. Very unlikely you're reading book three if you haven't read book one and two. So it's kind of a quick, if you imagine it like a recap, if you're watching a TV series, what happened last season. Yeah. But she does it in this way where it's not working an info dump. She does it through context. Well, I have a note about that, that she does a great job with this because it's the backstory or the exposition she includes is always prompted by something in the story present. So like you said, it's in context that is prompted by something in the moment, like the broom cleaning kit allows Harry to talk about Quidditch. Yes. A picture of Ron's family allows him to talk about the Weasleys. So it's not like the chapter starts with last year, Harry had to fight down this basilisk in the Chamber of Secrets. And then, oh, this other thing you don't know happened with Voldemort. Right. It's all very organic. She, You'll notice a pattern now if you're following these first chapters that she always does get a commentary on Voldemort in some way, but it's only prompted by exactly what Savannah has said right. because of something that's happening in his story. Also notice that Snape, one of my favorites, is always mentioned, but in Snape, but it's usually dealing like he's doing homework, you know, and his least favorite assignment that he has to do. Yeah, his Snape, least so. favorite teacher. Right, right. <laughs> You're always looking for those opportunities to blend external and internal. You're never just dumping internal. Right. So the next question, question number three, deals with point of view. Who's telling the story? We're in third person limited still. We do have a little bit of that 
omniscient feeling narrator at the very beginning of the scene and at the end. I don't have the text in front of me, but at the end, it's something like we zoom out and the narrator kind of talks about what's going to happen next with Harry. I yeah. think Abigail is going to grab it. Yeah, the last paragraph says, at that moment, Harry Potter felt just like everyone else, glad for the first time in his life that it was his birthday, which is fun. Right. It's the exact opposite of Chambers. Yes. And so <laughs> I have a note about that too, because in the beginning of the chapter, the omniscient narrator says, Harry is a highly unusual boy in many ways. He hated summer holidays. He really wanted to do his homework and he's a wizard. So it's a nice little open loop and closed loop by the omniscient narrator. Mm -hmm. But we're mixing it up from the previous two books where on his birthday, it's like the worst day. And he feels neglected and he feels sad about everything. Here, he has a good birthday and also rolling his up the stakes with the Hogsmeade visit. Mm -hmm. So it's the same, but different. Mm -hmm. And I want to say, because we are going to move into third person limited close with Harry for the majority of the story, but the right. narrative allows us to kind of feel like we're readers who then get pulled into the personal story with Harry. Right. It's interesting. Again, you spoke to 13 and I'll talk about this more in the character question, but we've seen how the Dursley Harry Potter relationship has started to mature. And through that, Harry starts to test his limits with them more which is interesting. Yeah. So this isn't the first chapter, but I just wanted to mention this because in the second chapter, Harry starts to try to outwit Vernon more vocally. Yeah. <laughs> and he bribes it, him. <laughs> yep, he bribes him and it's bold. Harry is always seen as a courageous character. It's, you know, he's in Gryffindor. Of course, he's courageous. It's one of those things that you're seeing them start to really start to stand his ground a little bit more. We're in Chamber of Secrets. Remember, there's a confrontation between Dudley and Harry, and Harry does stand his ground. But it's more so in a way that is not like challenging Vernon. Like Vernon is clearly right. the, the main antagonist in this family. Vernon is the one who literally in the second chapter says that he'll beat, he'll beat the stuffing out of him. Yeah. Like, you know, an adult, you don't want an adult saying that to you. And he's a giant guy too. And so yeah. I think it's like he's intimidating. So it's just interesting to see like as Harry is aging, moving from teenager to young man, who is right. going to start to use his voice and his own opinions a little bit more. Question number four, who should we care about the most? Yes. Harry Potter. Always, always <laughs> Harry, right? So it's it's really interesting to see through context. We're very happy that Harry is finally receiving yeah. some well-deserved birthday messages. You know, right. getting his first birthday card ever, like very exciting. I really like it to pull on the factor again. We know that Harry is bold and courageous. We know that he's sympathetic because the Dursleys mistreat him, among many other things. Like Harry is an orphan. Harry is always doing the right thing by the victim. He's always like trying to, to work for others who are people that we would root for and care about don't care right. about the Dursleys as much. But I do think that it's interesting as you're learning more about him through that balance of external and internal and seeing what he cares about. And one thing that I really like in this first chapter is that he gets this newspaper article that the Weasleys have won this big lottery. And he says a line of something like he couldn't think of anyone better who deserved a big heap of gold than the Weasleys right. who were very kind and very poor, like something like that. Right. It speaks to his humility. It speaks to a person of integrity, a person yeah. of, you know, humility, things like that. A good person. His people. And I like yeah, that about and that. It's a small detail, but it really speaks to his character. Yeah. And so you kind of touched on question six, which is core emotion. How should we feel? We feel happy about what's going on with Harry. We're, we're interested in this Hogsmeade thing, but for the most part, we're like, gosh, thank God he had a good birthday. The question we skipped was setting. So where and when does the story take place? We're in Harry's bedroom in Privet Drive. It's his 13th birthday. And the last one is about the stakes. So why should we care about what happens next? Or like, what do you care about? Mm -hmm. And this is what is going to be a great question to move us into the Five Commandments because right. it is a soft chapter, right? So there's not a ton. Really, chapter two is where we're going to see more of an exciting event happen. In yes. this, we're being even like the one of the main encounters in the first chapter is actually seen through retelling a backstory. And it's when Ron tries to call Harry and is screaming into the telephone. And Vernon basically is like, don't ever call this house again. And no one calls him the rest of the summer. So it's kind of this idea here of basically what the stakes are on an immediate level, but also on a grander level. Let's talk about Savannah real quick, because if it's an action story, then we're looking at life or death stakes. Right. right. If this scene is softer, how do we know it speaks to life and death stakes? Okay, so I have two answers to this, or a question and an answer. So I think we should explain what we mean by softer. 
And the way that I interpret this or feel it is that the conflict for Harry is more internal. So he's worried about not making noise. He's worried about the book that Hagrid sends him is like flapping around on the floor. He just doesn't want to get caught. What we learned that we didn't mention is he got out of his bedroom one day and he went to the cupboard under the stairs and got his school books and he snuck them upstairs. So he's not supposed to have all this stuff. And if he wakes up the Dursleys, he'll get caught and it'll get taken away. Right. So the, it's all internal for the most part conflict, whereas in scene or chapter two, scene two, it's more external. So it's we feel more excited. Yes. So that's one thing. Did you have anything to add? No, I th- I like that. Just that speaks back to the core emotion, too, because when it's something that's usually action dominated, the core emotion deals with more excitement. And when it's internally right. dominated, we're dealing with more of this like cathartic, like satisfaction type of yeah. emotion. And so the second part, I actually want to pause us on that because I want to talk about the value shift after we go through the five commandments yep. on yep. the life and death scale. Mm-hmm. But as a reader for me, what I cared about the most in this scene is we already talked about he's having a good birthday, but also is he going to get this permission slip signed? Because yes. we know he's telling us this is important to him and mm-hmm. he wants to do it. And we see, like Abigail said earlier in the second chapter, he's bribing Uncle Vernon to try yep. to get it signed. Yeah. So let's go ahead and move into the chapter and how we break it down. And I like that you've mentioned that because you're going to see in our analysis of the five commandments, a lot of things are happening in the scene in their softer ways. But the main thing that is really going to grab our attention is when the Hawksmaid letter comes in. So kind of looking at like how this is all developed and stuff like that. I like to start with Harry's goal. So like, what is he doing when the scene opens? He's trying to work on his history of magic essay without getting caught. This goal puts everything else into context. So the five commandments is a quick recap. We'll explain what each of them are. Inciting and sin, I just call it turning point, but some people call it progressive complication turning point, crisis decision, climax resolution. So I'll explain what those are as we go through. But the first one is inciting incident, and that's usually causal, meaning a person causes it, or coincidental, meaning a coincidence causes it. And basically it's this unexpected disturbance that either establishes a story goal or forces a character to change directions and how they're going to achieve their right. goal. So in this case, it opens with a goal, right? Do your homework without getting caught. Right. I find that most scenes do open with a goal because it's not like Harry's sitting there waiting for conflict, right? He's a real human who's in the middle of his life and we get dropped into that. So his starting goal is to do his history of magic assignment without getting caught. Mm-hmm. Then the inciting incident comes in. And for this one, I had two different options. I landed on one. I'll tell you both. Number one, you could say it's that he realizes he's been 13 for over an hour. Number two, you could say that he sees three owls flying towards his bedroom window. I landed on the owls flying towards his bedroom window because although the realization that he's 13 and he's been 13 for an hour, he knew this. He just forgot. He wasn't paying attention. But you said a key word, unexpected. Mm -hmm. It's not unexpected that he turns 13 on his birthday. It's unexpected that there's a giant blob of animal flying towards your window that happens to be three owls. What do you think that quick internal reflection of not recognizing that he's been 13 for an hour does for the story? Yeah, that's interesting because... We saw in the first two books that he was kind of, you know, tracking the time as it ticked away. And in this one, it's like, okay, he's not so concerned about that anymore because he's got friends, he's got Quidditch, he's got magic, he has schoolwork. So we are seeing a shift. Yeah. Is that what you picked up? His priorities and what he cares about. Yeah. And this birthday even ends up better for him. So it's kind of that interesting way. Yeah, it's like a mini foreshadowing. I would agree with you on that. It's the owls because it is unexpected. You can even get the sense like as a reader, whether or not you're analyzing it for analytical to become a better writer or editor or whatever you're looking at it for. If you're just reading it for fun, you can get a sense of like urgency and agency when the owls come. Like something is going to happen here. You know, we're going to have to address something in some way versus like, oh, you know, I, I didn't realize I was. Uh, 13 for the last hour. It's just not as urgent to me. Yeah. And the owls are fun because if you remember from book two, that first chapter in book two, he saw eyes in the bushes and Dobby was on his bed. Mm -hmm. So both of those things were kind of negative in book two. And here we kind of might expect that as readers like, oh, great. What kind of creatures flying towards a window? And then it's like, oh, surprise, it's birthday presents. Yes. And you know all these owls. Yes. Another reason I picked, or we both picked, owls flying to the bedroom window, this sets up the next thing he's doing in the scene, right? Is like opening his presents without getting caught. So Mm -hmm. he's pushing aside his schoolwork and shifting that goal slightly to read his mail, basically. And that's the key there, right? Because he started to shift 
in some sense. In the last episode, we talked about the difference between beats and scenes and scenes are a change in value and beats are a change in tactics. We haven't reached, of course, a value shift yet, but this moment, this, uh, you know, causal, it's the owls, causal event is going to start to move some sort of value that yeah. we can change, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And if we don't like the word tactic, because I know some people don't like saying, what does a change in tactic mean? Mm. Change in behavior. Sure. Yeah. Even so, better. I like it yeah. better. Yeah. <laughs> so that's that's the inciting incident. And then in my head, all the presents that he opens act as complications, even though they're great things. This is another fun thing I wanted to point out because a lot of writers are like, but how can I always have bad complications? Isn't that boring right. or isn't that right. melodramatic? If the goal is to not get caught and he's opening all these presents in an excited way, they become complications, even That's though right. they're good. Right. So just something fun. Uh, they get in the way of his scene goal because he doesn't want to get caught. Mm -hmm. And I like to just, you know, piggyback off that a bit because I use the word consequences when we talk mm -hmm. about crisis decisions. We'll talk about that in a second. But consequences aren't always negative either. So, you know, right. don't get stuck on one definition of things. Okay. Right. So let's look at turning points. A turning point, Savannah, action or revelation that really forces a character to make a crisis decision. Even if you don't make a decision, there are right. consequences, right? So there yeah. you go. There's the consequences. Go ahead. Talk to us Yeah. About so that. we both agree that this is when he sees the Hogsmeade permission slip and he reads it and it says, you can go to Hogsmeade if you get a parent or guardian signature. Mm -hmm. And this, I had to really reread this chapter a couple of times before we got on the call because I was trying to figure out like, I think it's this Hogsmeade letter, but really like we don't really act on that much until the second chapter in Chamber of Secrets. We decided that it was one scene over two chapters instead of right. two scenes, two chapters. But we both have come to the consensus that this is two scenes, two chapters because there are two different value shifts. But it's really interesting that you're seeing how the main event the thing that causes the main event in this scene, the letter, is going to raise the stakes for the next scene. We're looking at the character reflection of it in this scene versus the next chapter where it's going to be a little bit about louder action taken on right. that. <laughs> yeah. And so I want to talk about that more when we get to the end because I have a note on that. But sure. so, yeah, this is the turning point. Like Abigail said, it's that thing that kind of gets in the way of the scene goal. And now what is Harry going to do? Mm -hmm. So that's the crisis. What is Harry going to do about this? Is he going to ask his aunt and uncle to sign the permission slip mm -hmm. and risk getting into trouble or being humiliated or whatever else the Dursleys will make him feel because we know it's not going to be good? Or is he not even going to bother asking and then miss out on the Hogsmeade trips that he told us is important and really mm -hmm. cool? The climax here is really interesting because he can't do anything about it at two o'clock in the morning. And it right. even says right during this part that it's two o'clock in the morning. He gets back into bed and pushes off the problem for tomorrow. Mm hmm. So like Abigail said, he's not making a decision about, I mean, he is, but he isn't, right? It's mm -hmm. kind of a weird, squishy decision. Mm -hmm. But what I like about this decision is it sets up the goal for the coming scenes. That's right. And we see him act on this in scene two. Right. To look at that a little bit closer, kind of looking back at that idea of how a crisis question, the result, the climax acting on a crisis decision is what causes consequences. You can see here, what do you think the consequences would be? If his decision is, I'll deal with this tomorrow, which is kind of interesting because that's like Vernon's decision in the first yeah. book. I'll deal with this tomorrow. What consequence do you think that leaves him with in the resolution? Well, and this is interesting because you also have to remember, let's pretend this scene was happening at two o'clock in the afternoon. This it's scene different. would not work and it would be boring because you're like, okay, Harry, like, why can't you go ask Vernon now? Why are you being such a wuss, right? He can't really go act on it now because it's two o'clock in the morning. When you're thinking about writing your own stories, if you have, because I, I see a lot of writers who are like, they have weak crisis moments like this if it was two in the afternoon and he just is like, I don't want to deal with it. Mm -hmm. That's not interesting. So mm -hmm. the way that Rowling made it interesting was this happens in the middle of the night when he's trying to be quiet and do his homework. That's one thing to note. Your question was, what are the consequences? Is that he has to deal with it tomorrow. And he's anxious and, about it. And he's, yeah, he's going to be anxious about it all night. And then in the next chapter, we learn that Aunt Marge is coming to visit. Mm -hmm. So it's like his, that's, you know, his goal on some level is to deal with it tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And then here comes Aunt Marge. Yeah. So and to now look at the five commandments of role, because we started with goal and we want to see how have we moved in a value shift in a way to accomplish this goal or to right. not accomplish this goal. So you just to recap, you said that the main goal that we started with started before the inciting incident. 
And it was really to do homework quietly without getting caught because he smuggled these books under Vernon's nose. What value has changed now from the inciting incident to the resolution of the scene? And how does that still speak to how we moved closer to or further away from our goal or our new yeah. goal? This is going to be my favorite part of this whole conversation. But let me just quickly read you what I put for the resolution. So in the text, it actually says that he feels just like everyone else, glad for the first time in his life that it was his birthday. So that's kind of the vibe at the end of the scene, right? Normally, we look at things through three different levels, too. So we could talk about the three value shifts. From the reader's perspective, we're just, we're kind of feeling the happiness that Harry feels, right? Mm -hmm. He got his Hogwarts letter. He got presents. You know, we're feeling the momentum that the story has started. From Harry's perspective, it was kind of just another birthday, wasn't expecting much because why would he after the last two years? And then he gets present. So he's kind of feeling the same sense that the reader is, but also that little bit of dread because now I have to go ask Vernon to sign my permission slip. So those are kind of like the two things that readers would see and that Harry's feeling because he does not know the danger that's coming up. But if we were rolling, we would know Harry going to Hogsmeade is going to put him in danger. So this scene, Harry is relatively safe, as safe as Harry can be with Voldemort on the loose. And it just moves him slightly closer to danger because it's opening the door to Hogsmeade. Okay. And I love that you're going here because this is like literally what I was talking with a client the other day. And that idea when the character doesn't know the main thread, how do you get the main thread in there? Well, that's why it's so important that the author knows Right. Because then the author has opportunities to throw red herrings, to throw false breadcrumbs at them and turn them this way and that way, which creates setups for plot twists. You're just right. giving yourself opportunities to create plot twists. I'm a huge advocate for really know your outline. You need to know the end of your story before you write. I know that there are pantses out there. I know that that works for some people, but the majority of us really need to know where we're going, you know, and, and your genre. Yeah, in your genre, right? Yeah. Because that's going to give you the opportunities to create those big moments that are going to speak to your target audience and what and your target right. readers and what they're going to enjoy. So and thinking about that with Rowling, right? With thinking about like she knows that Hogsmeade is going to be a big danger. It's interesting that she throws even that letter out before we hear about Sirius in the background and the news, right? In the second right. chapter. Yeah. And it's the other thing I wanted to add on to what you said a minute ago is that knowing your genre and knowing your outline is going to help you not write scenes that go nowhere or that don't because mm -hmm. this could have very easily been a scene at breakfast where it's like introducing Harry and, and writers are always like, but this is just introducing his normal world. That's all I need to do. And it's like, yeah, but look how Rowling did it and included that doorway into the main plot. You One know. of the things that I'm continually mesmerized with J.K. Rowling and her writing and her ability to storytell in general is that no sentence is wasted. Like it yeah. blows my mind. Every yeah. time that I read Harry Potter, I'm, oh my gosh, literally no sentence is wasted. Everything yeah. is valued in some way to a greater picture story. And I guess that's why you can consider her a master plotter, right? So like she... Yeah. I, and then it's, it's curious to think about like, you know, do you need to know the whole series before you write each book in the series? Or can you just focus on the story if you know the end yeah. of the series? Well, and that's, so I work with a lot of fantasy sci-fi writers who are doing series. And I know that Rowling was a big planner. And I remember reading something where she, she said she knew the ending. Mm -hmm. And for me, with the writers I work with, I'm like, as long as we know who the main antagonist is, so in this case, it's Voldemort. And usually with the writers I work with, we talk about what are, what's his or whoever your antagonist is, what's their overarching goal for the series? How are they going to take them the steps to get there? And then kind of we layer in the protagonist to that. So usually it's not like we know how every book is going to go and we don't have outlines for everything, although you can make that, but we need to know who the main antagonist is, what they're doing and why. Mm -hmm. And then what are they going to do to actively achieve that? Right. goal over the and, series. And usually that goal has to directly conflict with the protagonist goal. So like right. that's why like they come kind of become shadows and lights, like they're kind of you know, right. replicas of each other in opposite ways. It's interesting to think about this first chapter too, and the idea of Hogsmeade being the central setting. It's going to be in a, a crucial setting for this story. It's also interesting to think about how now going back to the dynamics and the stakes and where they are at the beginning of the story, moving into that idea of anxiety in the second chapter, Harry is probably feeling for, through the night because he realistically knows that asking Vernon for permission will end in a no. Yeah. Like there's no way Vernon wants nothing to do with anything magical. He sees it as a disgrace. So yeah. he can't ask him like, but he has to ask him. Yeah. So now what the second chapter really becomes interesting about is he has to find a way to give a leg up 
on Vernon to create a bribe in some way. I think this is one of my favorite examples of how a scene that seems so average and so like catching readers up on what's happened in the last two books does play on those global stakes. And the details that are in there are interesting too. You know, yeah. I think this also what Rowling really did that was smart. If you are writing a series with multiple books, she always turns the head. She makes you yeah. create assumptions and expectations because of previous books. So, you know, right. book one and book two, we're expecting a climax with Voldemort. But in this book, we have a climax that involves the Dementors and Sirius Black. Right. I think it's brilliant that she throws scabbers in a photo in the first chapter. Right. And, like, and that is I have a note serious. on that. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So I took a note that it's funny that Ron in his letter to Harry says that Bill, his brother, says the sneakoscope that he sent Harry doesn't work properly because yep. it kept lighting up during dinner. And then Ron tells Harry, well, it's probably because Fred and George were there. And so as readers, we believe this because why wouldn't we? It's plausible. I have two things to say about this. So one, I see a lot of writers who they'll write something like this and then they go, and that's weird. It's like, hey, there's something weird happening here. But Rowling is so good at this because she says, hey, something's here. I'm going to tell you why. Here's a believable reason. But then really, here's your first clue that Scabbers is actually Peter Pettigrew. Yes. The wizard who betrayed Harry's parents to Voldemort. And just to put on another layer onto why Rowling's really good at this is sometimes she tells the truth and sometimes she does not. So, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that's it's fun. You, it will always keep you guessing because we've seen her do both. You really yeah. start spinning with, but is it going to turn or is it not going to turn? Because remember in Chamber of Secrets, how in if you actually read past the first chapter, they assume that it's the Malfoys that Dobby belongs to from the beginning, but they think it's a break. Right. So it's really right. interesting because what she does is she's like, hey, here's a probable solution as to where Dobby comes from, but it's probably Draco. And it's really yeah. Lucius, like really Lucius right. antagonistic. We're looking at something to pull us close into the detail. Pay attention, pay attention, because the ending will be surprising, but inevitable. So she's we can really good at misdirection. And the other thing I just remembered, because you were talking about how Hogsmeade becomes the main setting. Mm -hmm. Think about how constricted we were in Chamber of Secrets. Yes. The monster was in the bottom of Hogwarts. So we were really in Hogwarts. It was very Hogwarts focused. So it's kind of fun that we're adding in this new element. The other thing I wanted to say, because we know this is middle grade kind of getting into that young adult section, right? Yes. Yeah, um, we should talk about that. Mm -hmm. So I thought there was some fun humor bits. Vernon's always a source of humor and how Harry talks about him. But also like the topic of Harry's essay mm -hmm. is witch burning in the 14th century was completely pointless. Discuss. So it's like just these little things that highlight the humor for the middle grade reader, even if they're like not totally getting it, you know. And I love how, you know, it was really funny because I was doing, I read it and then I did the audio book version on, yeah. on a walk earlier today too. And the actor who does the readings in the audio books is fantastic. But it was so funny because that line came up and immediately caught my attention because of course we do know in real life there was witch burning. Yeah. You know? <laughs> it's this idea of like, it actually had me thinking, hmm, you know, like maybe there are witches out there. We don't know. Well, like we're, and wizards. You know? Part of the text says that like witches actually thought it was funny because they cast a spell that made the fire tickle them. Right. So like there's playing I mean, with them. How to make a really tragic thing in history be kind of fun and not so gruesome for young readers. Right. I think that was kind of cool. There was one um, like wanted to get caught intentionally. Because yeah. Because she liked, the, she she liked it. Sensation. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and the other thing that I noticed in this chapter I don't know if this was on purpose, but if it is, it's like the coolest thing. So Vernon tells Harry, don't talk to the neighbors. I can't remember why or when he says it, but that's kind of funny because we know later that Mrs. Fig is his neighbor who's been sent to watch him. It's not what Vernon meant, don't talk to the neighbors, but it's also kind of like a nod. Don't talk to the neighbors because she's actually not supposed to talk to you either. I like that there's irony in the fact that Aunt Petunia is obsessed with gossip and spying on people, but realistically right. the wizard community is constantly spying on yeah, her. Yeah, they always know what she's up to. Yeah. This whole book has one of my favorite examples of red herrings ever. So mm -hmm. it's so cool if you read the first chapter through that lens and you just see the little nods. And even in chapter two, we deepen the little nods and throughout the whole thing, there's misdirection and true clues and all the fun stuff. And all these great setups in the sense that I know when I was reading it, I probably wouldn't have even, you said before, you don't even think twice about it. As no. soon as she explains the sneak of stove is probably due to Fred and George who do pranks all the time. You yeah. don't even think about it. But, it's funny. Right. But when it comes out that it actually had purpose, it's, that's why it's the surprising but inevitable ending because it's been purposely planted in this. Yeah. Way. And 
Speaking of that, I remember the first time I read this. So I read, I was literally the same age as Harry every time I was reading a new book. And I remember the way she set up Percy Mm -hmm. and how there was like that vibe about Percy. I was Mm -hmm. like, wow, it's a sneak scope going off because Percy's the bad wizard. Or Mm -hmm. if we don't believe it's Fred, we're not going to be thinking of Ron's rat. You know, we're going to be looking at people. Yeah. So like the rat is like the most minuscule thing. And then you will start to learn about Animagus's like later in yeah. the story. So that those stakes start to build in the probability of where this could turn and why it turns. Yeah. It's so interesting because it's not even on your radar. You don't know what an Animagus is yet. So it's not even right. on your radar. Right. Well, and Scabbers is pretty gross. He has scabs yeah. all over him. He's like a worthless rat. Ron doesn't like him half the time. Crookshanks gets upset with him. He's so unlikely to do anything yeah. spectacular. Well, And that's another great reveal, too, because in the climax, the climax is actually probably the Dementor fight, but kind of like the climax, maybe at the end of the second act, when they when Sirius basically calls Peter Pettigrew out, he goes through and rattles through all the oddities of Scabbers. And you see that Scabbers has had all these oddities building since book one. Right. Yeah. So it's all these things where, like, I just remember Sirius rattling them off and I was like, oh, Oh yeah, my gosh, that's true. That's true. That's true. That's true. He's a human. Like, yeah. yeah. So it's kind of one of these big builds that has been really masterfully executed through the story. Yeah. It's pretty much a joy to read, no matter how many times you've read it. Yeah. And so. just to kind of go back to so like action stakes, though, when, when we're talking about life and death stakes, I think it's a good way to sum this up, Savannah. How do we know that this is impacting the action story? You've talked about how it's going to bring you to Hogsmeade, right, which is where a lot of life and death is going to be thrown. We're moving in that direction, but this isn't a direct attack on Harry's life in this moment. It's a chess piece. The idea that I think that you shouldn't overlook also that Scabbers is in a very, 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 very far background because he's actually going to be more the villain in addition to the, really, it's like the mentors, number one, right? They're going to threaten the life. Scabbers and Voldemort and Peter Pettigrew is yeah. right under it, right? Because Peter Pettigrew is going to be one who betrays everyone again in the, in the moments, right? Yeah. But it's really interesting to see how they're there, but they're not necessarily attacking you right now. Right. Yeah. So just I'd love to get your opinion real quick. What do you think the inciting incident for the inciting attack? Because in an action story, you need an inciting attack, which usually is like an inciting incident for the story itself, for the global story, the main storyline. Yeah. What do you think that attack is in this? Well, it's not in the first chapter. So what do you think? Yeah, it's not. And so it's been a while since I've read the book and Renee's analysis of this, but I know there's that scene where he leaves because he blew up Aunt Marge and he's sitting on the curb waiting for something mm-hmm. and the eyes see him through the bush. Yes. Which we then learn later is serious. Yeah. So on one hand, you could say it's that, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, That's where I would go. It's uh, yeah. because it's the grim. Right. Right. Like he's serious, looks like a dog that looks like the Grim, and constantly that becomes an escalated threat of the Grim, right? With right. Alani and things like that. What's interesting to me about that is it happens in chapter three, the night bus. And I've seen a pattern. I don't know if you've seen this at all, Savannah, but usually if you don't have an inciting incident by chapter three in your writing, your pace is probably off. I've noticed yeah. a little bit like that. Maybe, I mean, I could be wrong with that, but that's what I've noticed. It tends to be that if you haven't had, some sort of in the really the inciting instant of the story by chapter three I feel like yeah. it gets a little bit slow for me but that and might so be my personal take. that's funny because in theory you could have three very bloated chapters and you're not getting to the inciting incident until like 20,000 words mm-hmm. which is not ideal either so let's what I like to say is like it's usually around 10 to 12 percent of your entire manuscript. Mm-hmm. It's usually halfway in your beginning section of your story. If the beginning is 20 to 25 percent, 10 to 12 percent is halfway there. Yeah. And yeah, the reason I always like to think about like you see those maps of plots where it's like we build up to something and then we kind of go down, build up to something and then go down. That first peak is usually your inciting incident. Yeah. So it's like we need to be building to keep that pacing intention because yeah, if you don't have it, whether it's chapter three or whatever that 10 to 12 percent mark, yeah. why are they reading your book? You will stop. And if you're doing traditional publishing, I've seen a lot of agents say, OK, give me the first three chapters before they say, give me the full. So right. if you don't get it by chapter three, it's out. Right. It's easy to put it yeah. down. So just kind of as an FYI type of thing. Now, what else is really interesting about that is that you're talking about 10 to 12 percent. And I think it's great that you're pulling that out. We've talked about in the past about how the ideal scene length is around 2,000 to 2,500 words. It's called the potato chip scene length. 
Mm-hmm. It's like that place where readers get to the end of the chapter and, oh, can I read one more? Do I have time for one more? Rowling right. in these earlier books hasn't always been 2,500 words per scene. Sometimes they've been a little bit longer. So how, when you're thinking about, I guess, like just to kind of ask you a question, Spana, when you're helping your clients with this idea of what is the perfect word count, do you think that people get caught up in the word count and you focus on percentages or like, do you focus on events? How do you help them in restructuring about what really matters versus the ideal, whatever it is? I find that most writers think in chapters and that's kind of it. So they're just like, I need to write a chapter. A lot of chapters can be like 3,000 to 4,000 words. So Mm -hmm. Because they don't know any better, they end up just writing three to 4,000 words without any scenes in there or anything. So I like to strip all that away and just say, let's write a scene with Mm -hmm. the structure we talked about Mm -hmm. and try to keep it somewhere between under 3,000. Even if you're at 3,000, 3,500 on your first draft, it's okay. You can strip things out later once you know what's happening in your story Mm -hmm. and what's important and what's not. But yeah, I find you cannot think about chapters at the same time you're writing scenes. It's just too much. No, I think that's a great idea. Break the chapters later. And even, you know, more speaks to how this first chapter and second chapter have an overlap in a ways because the Hogsmeade is kind of what creates the goal for the next chapter, right? Yeah. I think the idea here is making sure that they're always building around the story event. So the conflict that puts the protagonist in conflict with some sort of antagonist in some way, like. That event is what you walk away with the summary. It's how you summarize what the chapters are really about and what walks away with the purpose of the value shift and things like that. If you go back to Savannah's summary, a lot of other things happen in this first chapter, but really our attention is first and foremost pulled towards that letter because that is what creates excitement. Right. And I just looked at the word count for this first chapter. It's 3,600 words. She tends to be longer in certain chapters because there's more to set up. There's world building, there's summary But notice how it's not an info dump, like we said. When I'm working with fantasy and sci-fi writers, something we, because the question is always like, but I need to show this part of the world or, but I need to explain this. It's like, cool, you can do that, but let's build a scene first and see what organically fits from that, like backstory, exhibition, you know, world building side and layer that in organically. And then if it doesn't fit, it's because we don't need to know it right now. So then put it somewhere else. We'll figure out a spot to put it. That's Um, where it's like weaving backstory as the story unfolds, not trying to give us everything all at once because we'll just lose interest. Right. Because imagine reading this first chapter and it's like, imagine we learned that Scabbers had been in Ron's family for 12 years and he's been looking pretty bad lately and blah, blah, blah. And Voldemort in book one, this happened and 10 pages later, we're in the summary of book two. We don't have time to hear more about Hogsmeade. I think it's a paragraph Mm -hmm. and we get Mm -hmm. all we need to know. Because we're going to experience it. And that's way more fun. (laughs) Right. Yeah. Well, that is a great analysis. Thanks, Savannah. I always love asking you questions. You always teach me something when we hop (sighs) on our conversation. So fun. It's great. So fun. So great to have you in my corner and for everyone to be able to listen to you. It's just wonderful, wonderful. That's the overall analysis of this first chapter for Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban. We'll move on to Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire, book four in a future episode. So stay tuned for that. But until then, can't wait to talk to you. And I thank everyone for listening to us and going through this journey with us. Yeah, thanks for listening along. And we challenge you now to go look at this chapter and see what you would pull out and just see if you can feel these five commandments. Have fun and we will see you guys next time. So that's it for today's show. As always, I want to thank you so much for tuning in and showing your support. If you want to check out any of the links I mentioned in this episode, you can find them over at savannahgilbo.com forward slash podcast. And if you haven't done so already, make sure you subscribe to the show because there's going to be another brand new episode coming out next week. If you're an Apple user, I'd really appreciate it if you took a few seconds to leave a quick rating and review. Your ratings and reviews tell iTunes that this is a podcast that's worth listening to. And in turn, that helps this show get in front of more fiction writers just like you. So that's it for today's show. I'll be back next week with a brand new episode. Until then, happy writing.